every appointment was, please have everything be okay. It was a lot of that until the fetal echo at 20 weeks. Once they said that her heart had four chambers and that she looked completely healthy, I just started crying. That was a huge relief for me. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. I'm also the mother of a heart warrior, and that's the reason I am the host of your program. I'm very excited about today's show to feature a special heart mom. Today's show is entitled HLHS Survivor and Mother. Megan Roswick Didier is 30 years old and was diagnosed with HLHS or hypoplastic left heart syndrome at seven days of age. She had four open heart surgeries at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, including the Norwood at nine days of age. She also had the Hemi Fontan at seven months old and the Fontan at 13 months old and a surgery to open her ASD at two and a half years of age. Her doctors encouraged her to set her own limits, which she did. She enjoyed gymnastics and sports in high school and never let anything hold her back. In her early 20s, she suffered a devastating stroke and took a year to recover. Meg has studied neuroscience at the University of Cincinnati, coaches gymnastics, and advocates for better patient care for adults with congenital heart defects. In 2022, she embarked on her biggest journey yet as she and her husband, Dustin, became parents to daughter, Lucy. Meg joins us today to talk about her experiences of pregnancy, birth, and motherhood as an HLHS survivor. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Well, I am so excited to have you on the program. I feel like I have known you forever because your mom wrote for my book, The Heart of a Mother, and we became online friends when the internet was very young. And so I've always been impressed with how well you seem to do as a little girl. Your mom was always so sweet about sharing fantastic stories and little videos of you doing gymnastics. And it has been so much fun to watch you grow up over the years. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about your congenital heart defect? Because HLHS is kind of a garbage pail term and lots of different defects qualify as HLHS. Yeah, absolutely. And so I was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which means the left side of my heart was so severely underdeveloped that it doesn't function right now. And so when I was born, they had to reroute my circulatory system so my body could function and sustain itself with just the right side of my heart. And so there's obviously a lot that had been done to my circulatory system to be able to make me live as normal of a life as I have been able to. So I'm amazed that you had probably what's considered an old Fontan if you had it when you were so young and that you're still doing great with your original Fontan because my heart warrior had to have a Fontan revision. Yeah, I've always had that discussion with other providers and trying to figure out because a lot of the time, like the time when I had my Fontan, there was a newer Fontan and older Fontan. There have been so many different versions. and so. I had the upgraded, I guess, in 93, the newest version mm -hmm. Fontan that was available at that point. And so I have no idea if that contributed to anything with me, but I had, I'm not sure if it was necessarily the old, old Fontan or if it was the new old. You know, there was just so many versions, <laughs> it's hard to keep track of. <laughs> there are, there are. So my heart warrior had the Fontan two years after you had it in 1995. and the new thing at that time was the fenestrated Fontan because they were doing some research that showed that kids who had a fenestrated Fontan tended not to get PLE. And so they were thinking that having that pop-off valve prevented protein-losing enteropathy, which, as we know, is something that's really scary. So my heart warrior had the fenestrated Fontan. Both of you guys had the intracardiac Fontan. There was no extra cardiac Fontan in the 90s. And it's so rewarding to see that some of you long-term Fontaners are still doing well with that intracardiac Fontan. Absolutely. And it's so incredible to see the progression, especially in the past 
29 years since I had my Fontan. It's just incredible to see this new generation coming up and all of the resources they have available to them and all the new research that's coming out. It's just really exciting to be able to see. Oh, absolutely. Because when you were young, when my heart warrior was young, there was almost nothing available. It was a pretty dark time as far as parents having resources. So it has been exciting to see all these new resources that are available. Now I'm going to fast forward because you went many years being very healthy. And what some of our listeners may not know is that you even competed in gymnastics in the pre-Olympic level. Isn't that true? Yes. So I competed gymnastics at a high competitive level for many years. I was a gymnast for 14 years. And my mom, it was actually funny when I have conversations with her now, especially after having a daughter of my own. It is pretty incredible to think about how she and my father allowed me, listen to my doctor and my surgeon who said she will set her own limitations. Seeing how they actually stuck to that, I mean, it's pretty incredible because I don't know if it was my own daughter, if she had just had open heart surgery, if I would just be just on top of her wanting to protect her or being yeah. able to sit back and let her do what she wants to do, which is what the cardiologist had told my parents. So when my mom had gone up for an appointment, she found a gymnastics facility that was very close to the hospital. And of course, uh -huh. she did this intentionally <laughs> sure. to make sure that if anything were to happen, I was right next to the hospital. And I had lived about four and a half hours from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. My mom made sure that the gymnastics facility was close to CHOP and made the tester <laughs> on how I would do. And since then, kept bringing me to gymnastics and she would keep her eye on me without me 100% knowing. So she would maybe be there in the bleachers looking at me or she actually became a coach. She's an amazing oh. coach. She was a gymnast herself. And oh. so she, oh. yep, she was a coach for not myself when we were in Cincinnati. However, when we moved to Puerto Rico, she was my coach for a little bit. So she always had her eye on me without me 100% knowing. <laughs> so that's to me, great. everything was completely normal. <laughs> yeah, so you felt just like the other kids there. You didn't feel like your mom was hovering over you or restricting you in exactly. any way. She was just really good at being sneaky about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that Patty was also a gymnast, so that's interesting. Yeah, and I think that was outside of probably the fact that I was just crazy bouncing all over the place. <laughs> like, for instance, when I was three, that's when I had started gymnastics. However, when I was two and a half, I had my last open heart surgery. And during recovery, I think this was day three or it was very early. I had brought a mat from the playroom into my room and then tried to start flipping because the nurses assured my mom she's not going to do anything that is not good for her. Just let her play around. And then once they saw me flipping, they said, oh, OK, maybe that's not so good with a fresh <laughs> chest scar. <laughs> and so that gave my mom the indication that gymnastics might be in my future. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I could just see you as a little kid tumbling on the floor and trying to do flips and the nurses may be flipping out. <laughs> yes, at first thing, let her set her own limitations. They'll be fine. And then running and saying, okay, maybe not. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> You did have a lot of energy. Your mom used to tell us, and those of us who also had little ones, we were just amazed at what you were able to do. But when I saw that you had a stroke, oh my goodness, Meg, that just touched my heart so much. And I am sure it was terrifying for you as well. I actually saw a documentary where you talked about this, but maybe all of our listeners have not seen that documentary. So can you tell us about the warning signs you had regarding your stroke and what you would attribute to your successful rehabilitation? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to first start before even talking about my stroke story. Obviously, we're not 100% sure as to what caused the strokes. However, one thing that I have been incredibly shameful over, however, I think it's incredibly important to note to your listeners, especially potentially patients, that I was not taking my aspirin consistently whatsoever. Mm. 
And that was something that I was taking because that's supposed to be helping in preventing heart attacks and strokes and helping thin your blood. And right. so that was something I was supposed to be taking every day. However, I was not. And okay. was that the cause of it? Who knows? But that is something that now I will not miss a day of. And yeah. I think that was incredibly important. So just having that information before even going into my stroke, you have an idea that there might have been some areas that I was setting myself up for a potential stroke. The crazy thing is my dad was not living in Ohio at the time. He was very rarely in Cincinnati because he was living in California. And he was back in town and I made time to meet up with him for lunch because he was only here for a short amount of time. And we were like, okay, let's just meet up for lunch. It'll be very quick, but we'll be able to see each other. I met up with him at our favorite spot, the Root Beer Stand in Cincinnati in Blue Ash, Ohio. And when we were there, everything was completely fine. I brought my big English Mastiff with me. We were outside. And then as we were walking back to the car, all of a sudden, it was almost like I got dizzy, but mm -hmm. everything started shifting and shaking a little bit in my vision. And I got a little wobbly and I thought that was a little weird. Mm -hmm. And I was eating potato chips and I bit down and bit my hand, but I didn't feel it at all. Like sometimes when you have a numb hand or a numb foot or you're sitting on it weird, you can almost still feel pressure, yeah. but it's numb. This, I had no idea with my hand. Uh -huh. And that was one of the craziest things to me. So I took it out. Obviously, I could tell it wasn't potato chips. That was the only reason I knew that I had bit down on my hand was because it wasn't chips. And so I pulled it out and I was like, that's really strange. But I've had back issues in the past. I fractured my back from sports. And so I was like, okay, maybe just trying to come up with all of these excuses in my head. Maybe that's the cause. And this was happening in a matter of 60 seconds going yeah. through my head. And then all of a sudden I looked over at my dad to tell him that something was wrong and it was just babbling. And it actually wasn't even babbling. It was just sound. And I was trapped in my head. I could try really hard. I was trying to say, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke to my mm -hmm. dad. But it was just babbling coming out of my mouth. And I was clearly thinking in my head. I knew exactly what was going on. Inside my head felt normal, but mm -hmm. I couldn't get that information out and I just kept repeating through my head trying to say I'm having a stroke I'm having a stroke and then at first my dad thought I was just messing with <laughs> oh, no. it was kind of like a dark funny thing but he thought I was just like joking around with him he was like stop okay like I grabbed onto his shoulders and was jumping and then I think he realized very quickly that something was wrong and he looked at me in a state of shock realizing that his daughter was having a stroke in front of him. And okay. in a matter of another minute, I was able to talk. And I said, I'm having a stroke. And my dad threw my dog in the car, ripped my a brand new car, and he ripped my door handle off my car because <gasps> my car was locked. Oh, and he ripped it off, trying, wow. to get, trying to get everything in the car. And so wow. we were right next to the hospital. And so we went right to the hospital. In retrospect, both of us look back on that and said we should have called an ambulance. Sometimes you're in that moment and you're just not thinking clearly. And yeah, and think about how much time you would have lost and every second matters. That probably was a good instinct. And that's what we were thinking. And I remember as he got in the car, I told my dad, up at the gas station, I need aspirin. And it is too far. We're too far from that. <laughs> oh, we need to get to the hospital. Wow. And so I was like trying to think and my dad was driving me and I called the hospital and let them know ahead of time that I was on my way and I was pretty sure I had just had a stroke. So they were waiting for me and we went through that. And my mom had just graduated with her master's in social work the day before. So she was enjoying a well-deserved massage during my stroke. Oh, no. And so I was trying to call her to let her know that something had happened and yeah. obviously she was in her very well-deserved massage and so at the oh. end of the massage she found out and rushed to the hospital and is now scarred from getting massages and I feel very bad about that but oh, no. she yeah oh, no. had, I can understand that would not be a fun way to come out of a very peaceful massage but she ended up coming and seeing me and it was a very large shock to the entire family because I think 
this was one of the first times that I had anything really surprisingly major happen in a very long time, like 20 years. It was very difficult on all of us to try to wrap our heads around what had just happened. And for me, mentally and emotionally, was incredibly challenging. I had just taken my calculus exam. I had taken a bunch of exams because I was in college and I felt like, how am I going to be able to go back to college if my head isn't where it was? And I was in the middle of taking sequential classes. And so I was thinking, how am I going to be able to remember the things that just learned this previous semester? Because my memory was not wonderful in all cases. I was very fortunate with how everything had turned out and where my deficits were. However, it was incredibly challenging to have that step back. Absolutely. So it sounds like the first episode was what we call a TIA or a transient ischemic accident. But then you ended up having a bigger stroke after that. Does that sound accurate? What we are a hundred percent sure because what ended up happening is there was very clear lesions on my head where it was clear that I had stroke. And so they were wondering if the speech, the aphasia, was one of the things that may have lasted a shorter amount of time and the other thing could last a little bit longer. We weren't totally sure, but there was definite permanent damage seen on exactly where they expected it with my deficit. And that was the biggest, for what my understanding was, the biggest determining factor between a TIA and a stroke was if you were able to see visual damage on the MRI. Mm -hmm. Again, obviously not a clinician, but that was my understanding of it, even though the symptoms appeared to not have lasted very long because it did seem like a TIA. And so Mm -hmm. that's another reason we were all very surprised when it came back with lesions. It makes you wonder if maybe you had strokes at another time in your life. Could they tell if the strokes were fresh or if they were old? They said that they weren't able to 100% say that. However, the one lesion I had was shrinking at the rate that they anticipated if it had happened at that point. So they were pretty sure that one was a fresh stroke. However, the other one that was on the other side of my head, because I had like on both hemispheres and in about the same area, they said that could have happened at a different point. And it's interesting because My mom and I have always joked almost about this instance when I was 13 years old, when I was at gymnastics, where all of a sudden, I remember I was on beam and all of a sudden I forgot who I was, where I was, and who people were around me and somehow knew to go to my mom. And I remember going up to her and saying, I don't know who I am. I don't know any of these. I don't know where I am. And I remember running to the bathroom and she had thought it was a panic attack because we didn't have stroke on our minds, especially with that. Yeah, we we weren't talking about it back then, Meg. The doctors really didn't talk to us about it much back then. I know, not at all. And there were so many things that we just weren't on the lookout for. I mean, Mm -hmm. I have liver to that's another huge one, but right. that's another whole yep. session, right? We just thought I had a panic attack. So immediately when they had said that there was another one, but it, it might not have been as fresh or as recent as the other, mm-hmm. we both thought of that time. So whether or not that was it, or maybe that was another one that the area in my brain had repaired or cleared up, or I have no idea how that works. But that was just the only instance looking back, us saying, okay, that could have been a time where that was another stroke. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests. 
and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Meg, you've been lucky to find a wonderful husband and a father in Dustin. So can you tell us about how you first met and how he responded to you finding out that you had a heart condition? Of course. So one of the things about Dustin is that he is a nurse. He currently is an adult ICU nurse. However, when we met, he was a pediatric nurse. Dustin and I met in 2016 at an event at 50 West Brewery in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a nurse at Society Children's at that time. And that is where I was also going for my cardiac checkup. He mentioned where he worked and I blurted out, oh, I go there. I definitely <laughs> got a weird look from him on yeah. the way of the children's hospital. Yeah. And it just came out. I, it was an accident. <laughs> and I ended up backpedaling and explaining that I was born with a CHD called HLHS. And he interrupted me and said, oh, a single ventricle. And oh, wow. I was completely taken aback. Yeah. And it was just so cool to be able to talk to someone who knew what I was talking about. Yeah. And it was just a totally different experience. I remember texting a couple of my CHD friends after and saying, oh, my God, I met a nurse. <laughs> That's all you need to say in the CHD community as a patient. That's all you need to say. Yeah. <laughs> and so everyone was super excited because as a patient, I think all of us dream of having someone who has some sort of understanding of what we're talking about in ways sure. of what our health is, especially if we're going through procedures and things like that. I can't yeah. tell you how amazing it is to know that I have my husband who is very well versed in medical terminology and has an understanding of everything that's going on in the room mm -hmm. from a nursing standpoint. And so it's very nice. But we had many conversations over the course of our relationship on what the future might look like. And that's obviously never a fun discussion, but it's been incredibly important for us to have. And we've had multiple discussions when we just started dating, like a few months in, trying to see if this was something serious. And so, okay, this is actually a lifelong thing that I have. And it was one of those discussions at first. And then it moved on to, okay, I'm really in love with you. I see a future with you. This is the thing to take on. However, what I always say is that every single person, no matter who they are, is going to be bringing some sort of baggage into a relationship. Sure. And the most important thing is that you have someone there to carry it with you. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what it is. And for me, it was nice to have a partner that would carry that with me. And so that was that big discussion. Are you willing to help carry this baggage with me? And then once we got married, the discussion, of course, then turned to okay, what route of family planning do we want to take and what does that look like? And so it's been a lot of different discussions throughout the course of our relationship. Sure. And that's how it looks because it's really difficult to have one large giant discussion because yeah. there are just so many things involved in it. And so that's how I and uh, Dustin, both of us, approach our relationship and kind of breaking it up into smaller discussions. Sure. in the point of which we were at in our relationship. So it's nice to know that you met this man, you were attracted to this man, and he had a nursing background. He knew the word single ventricle. That tells you something right there, right? <laughs> exactly. And I remember him walking in to the event. I had no idea who he was, and I can remember exactly what he was wearing. And oh. I just remember thinking to myself, Oh, I have an empty seat next to me. I hope he sits next to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Obviously having no idea who he was. I, I was immediately smitten. <laughs> oh my goodness. Did he sit next to you? He did. He sat next to me. And I actually was the one to make the first move <laughs> on pretty much everything. And it is funny. <laughs> Now, does it surprise me, Meg? You're a very <laughs> self-confident young woman, and good for you. You saw somebody who sparked interest, and you weren't afraid to make that first move. I think that speaks highly of you. <laughs> exactly. I'm just so impressed that he seemed nonplussed by what you had to say and just came back with the right terminology. That seems like a God thing to me, Meg. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Getting married is a huge milestone for so many people. Tell me about your wedding day. I love hearing about wedding days. So Dustin and I decided that we wanted to do a very small, intimate elopement with our parents and our siblings and then do a bigger event with our friends. However, COVID happened. And so we all know how that occurred. So we ended up, we eloped in actually 2018 in Las Vegas. However, we went to a dry lake bed and had someone do the ceremony out on a dry lake bed because the photos were just absolutely gorgeous. We didn't want to really go out and spend a bunch of money on a huge ceremony for us personally. And so we decided that we would just do this small thing with our family. And it was just fantastic because for us, the interesting thing is we were just excited to be married. The mm-hmm. wedding kit fell I, I know it sounds bad, but it almost didn't even matter to us in the way that it was just, okay, we already, we just don't want to be together. This is just a formality. We already mm-hmm. feel like we are going to be together forever. We did it truthfully because we knew our parents were going to be so incredibly disappointed if they weren't able to be a part of it. And so we wanted to make sure that we had an event where we could all get together, have our families both together and have it be something super on the down low where we could all just hang out and get to know each other a little bit better from like the blending of the family side. I just love that. That's so sweet that you already felt like you were married. The wedding itself was just a formality because in your hearts, the two of you were already together. Exactly. I love that. Well, (laughs) you have welcomed a daughter into the world in August when my baby was diagnosed with a single ventricle heart way back in 1994. I was told this was a no-no for kids with HLHS. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that you defied the odds again (laughs) and that you were able to do this, but it is really a miracle. Let's talk about your cardiologist. How did your cardiologist feel about this? And what was it like for you? Did you have tons of extra appointments? Kind of walk us through what it was like to get pregnant with your baby and to have a healthy baby. Absolutely. When I first started this, of course, it started like I had previously talked with the conversation between myself and Dustin. What route do we want to be taking? And there are multiple routes for family planning. And for us, we wanted to try for a child naturally. And so we said, okay, let's talk to cardiology. Let's figure out what they have to say about this. Our first step in any of this was to talk to each other to figure out what do we want to do first? Because we felt like if we were to go and start the process without the conversation first, it was going to kind of skew what we were wanting to do. And so Mm -hmm. we felt like having that conversation before even looking into the options was the best route to go for us. And then of course, reevaluating. But like you said, when I was younger, when us older kids were younger, that was a huge no-no. I had had multiple conversations with different providers. I've had many providers or many cardiac teams in my life because I've moved around a lot for the most part. And so I had a different cardiac team growing up and they said, we, we aren't sure. We don't think that this is a great option. We don't think that your heart is going to be able to handle it. And so now that it's what, 20, 15, 20 years down the road from a lot of those initial conversations, there has been more research. There is mm-hmm. more data. Right. Um, and there have been people with Fontan circulation to go through pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. so now reapproaching the topic with my care team, I had also sought out my team at Stanford based off of discussions from my now, he was still retired when I had the discussion with him, but my now retired surgeon, as well as just my own individual research. My specific cardiologist at Stanford, Dr. Louie, has gotten multiple individuals with Fontan circulation through pregnancy and works closely with the Stanford Children's Hospital and their maternal fetal medicine team in making sure that everyone is on the same page. And they even have monthly conferences about the pregnancy to talk to the OB team as well as cardiac team and saying, okay, what's the latest test saying? What's the birth plan? And so they were very well connected. And my OB that he recommended to me 
at Stanford, her actual specialty is maternal cardiac disease. And so wow. PhD, maternal CHD is with her specialty and is her specialty. And so I wow. felt like I was in great hands and I knew that they had a plan and had done it before. And so a lot of things that I tell people is if you aren't getting the answer you want from your, your team right now, because it's still taboo and because it's still a newer discussion, go get a second, third, fourth opinion. That's what, mm. it's, essentially that's what I had done. And I had thought yeah. that team out. So once Dustin and I had made the decision that we were going to try for ourselves, we went to cardiology and my cardiologist said, when you make your yearly appointment, make sure you tell them to put a note in there that we are going to be talking about pregnancy because he mm -hmm. wanted to create another 15, 20 minutes in the appointment sure. to make sure that we had those discussions, which I thought was incredibly fantastic. It was just great to have that time set aside for that discussion. And through this discussion, he also had me to the maternal fetal doctor, Dr. Catherine Bianco at Stanford Children's, who was, I could just go on for days about how amazing she is. And so through that, they said, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to do a set of tests. And through that, we're going to evaluate your risk level. We can evaluate our risk level for a general population, which we're going to tell you right now is high risk, no matter what your tests are going to say. Sure. And from a Fontan population, we're going to be able to tell you if you're on the lower end or the higher end of risk for Fontan. And so it was nice to have those two scales because it helped me understand a little bit because if you say you're high risk, it's duh, of course I'm high risk. <laughs> but having those two scales helped me really understand my risk level. So the test they wanted to do, they wanted to do a stress test. They wanted to do a EKG and an echo. They also wanted to do a liver scan, which I'm just going to tattle on myself on your podcast, Anna. <laughs> Another okay. tattling thing I will say about myself is that I canceled that appointment because I was too nervous to get my liver scan. Um, and so that that was redone. But that I will say that was supposed to be part of the plan. And that's a whole liver is a whole other ball game. It's a very yeah. nerve wracking thing, especially it as is. an older patient where you're saying I have no idea. And so. Sure. That should have been done, but I did not do it. And so from the results that they had, I had another visit with my cardiologist who said, from a Fontan level, you're on the low risk. And so we it. decided to go ahead. And one of the things he said is from a genetic perspective, obviously they can't look at your genetics right now and say, this is exactly what causes HLHS. Right. And so for a... I would say, quote unquote, normal person, a typical anatomy, you have about like a two to 3% chance of having a, a child with a CHD. And myself, I had about a four to 6%, five to 6%. And so it was just a slight increase. But my cardiologist always said, that's a 95% chance that everything is going to go perfect. Right. And so that's why I was like, how he's been those. Mm -hmm. And so we had all of the conversations of I'm going to have to start Lovenox during pregnancy whenever that happens. And if there were any medications that needed to be adjusted, I was not on any medications that needed to be adjusted. And so that was okay. And we also discussed birth options. A lot of it was hypothetical at that point, of course. Mm -hmm. And it was more, these are just things that we're going to be discussing once that time comes. And I was also moving to Alaska with my husband because my husband's a travel nurse. And <sighs> so we were moving to Alaska and my cardiologist that just asked us like, please, if you could wait until you're back in the lower 48, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and so we, <laughs> yeah. we decided to listen to him on that. And so when we came back down from Alaska, we decided that we were going to start trying. And I was very well convinced that it was not going to happen. I wasn't really? so, I'm optimistic at all. I was very much, we can try because it's not going to happen. Just know it's not going to happen. And that was the mental state I was in. It was more, I now looking back, I was very much protecting myself because mm -hmm. I was so scared to get attached to any potential child. And yeah. so I was just saying, if I do get pregnant, it's going to go away. Like there, there's no way uh -huh. it's going to work. And it was not a healthy mental state. And that's one of the reasons I say prepare yourself as much as you can for the emotions that are in this, no matter what family planning route you take, because mental health was something that I almost couldn't prepare myself for. And so having those healthy coping mechanisms in place prior is incredibly important. Once I got that test, 
that line that said I was positive, it was a whirlwind of, did I just make a giant mistake? Did I, uh, is, is my child going to hate me because aww. I just put my body at risk to, in a selfish way to have a child because I wanted to myself. And now that's obviously not selfish, but th- those are the things that I was experiencing and feeling. And it was very challenging. One of the most challenging things mentally for myself. I wish I had enjoyed it more than I did because I was so scared that something was going to happen. Every appointment was, please have everything be okay. It was a lot of that until the fetal echo at 20 weeks. Once they said that her heart had four chambers and that she looked completely healthy, I just started crying. That was a huge relief for me. But the appointments didn't really start increasing until I would say my second trimester. I didn't meet with the team until I was 12 weeks, which might be surprising because it was surprising to me because I thought they would meet with me much earlier. And Mm -hmm. again, I'm sure this is all center to center based, Mm -hmm. but they were going to wait 12 weeks, which is standard for most women who are pregnant to wait around 10 to 12 weeks until they have their first appointment. I had my first appointment. I got to hear her heartbeat, which was the most glorious thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh And it was amazing to say, okay, everything's going well. And then I would have an appointment the next month. Okay, everything's going well. And then it would increase to two every two weeks. And then by the end of it, by the last month and a half, I was at four appointments a week. Four oh, to five wow. appointments a week. Okay. And so we had to, I forgot what we had to submit, but we had to submit something to say how many prenatal appointments we had. It ended up coming to 47 appointments <laughs> in wow. those nine months. And it was definitely draining, but I'm just so grateful. The entire process outside of second guessing my choices, but outside of second guessing myself and thinking, did I just make a mistake? Which I truly don't know if there's much you can help. I feel like you're going to feel that way either way. If you are trying to get pregnant and end up pregnant with a CHD because you just second guess yourself and your choices, which is completely, I feel normal. And so that was challenging. But towards the end, I got really excited. And I just loved feeling her kick and everything like that. And I knew that my care team was having those monthly appointments or monthly conferences where they were discussing my case, my cardiac test. And I only saw the cardiologist two times throughout my entire pregnancy. Everything else was through OB because everything went well with me cardiac wise. They had these conferences and they planned how they wanted my birth to go, where it was going to happen, who was going to be involved, the day it was going to happen. And it ended up being a scheduled C-section. And they said from the very beginning, you're not going to go past 37 weeks gestation because that would just add so much more pressure on my heart that they felt that is considered full term and that she would have a great chance of survival. I ended up giving birth with her at 36 weeks and a half because for scheduling purposes, I had my cardiac anesthesiology team, my cardiac team, my OB team, and surgical. Anyone that was needing to be there was already and prepared. And so that was the really nice aspect of having a scheduled C-section because everything was just perfectly ready and prepared and nothing was emergent. So that was a very nice part of my birth that I didn't know how I was going to feel about not trying to get induced because with an induction, they said that I had a very low threshold for having a C-section and I had no signs of labor. And so if I were to get induced with no signs of labor, more than likely I was going to end up in a C-section anyway. And so that was one of the reasons they wanted to just say, let's just do a scheduled C-section so that way we are all prepared. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff that happened in that nine months, but that is as close to the gist of it as I can give you. (laughs) Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. 
Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Before the break, Meg, we were talking about you getting married and planning your family, but in this segment, I'd like to talk about your future. I am so amazed at little Lucy, and I'm so glad that you put pictures of her on Facebook so I could actually see what she looks like. Mm-hmm. Do you think Lucy will get a little brother or a little sister someday? So that is a huge discussion that Dustin and I have been having very recently because from a cardiac standpoint, everything went really well for me. And I have been given the green light as far as a cardiac perspective on saying, okay, you can try for a second, but please plan it with us like what I did with the first. And so that way everyone is just ready and prepared. I specifically am thinking that I want to get my exercise tolerance up a lot. I am out of shape for myself right now, of course, after just having a baby and not being able to keep up my normal routine. Sure. And I haven't totally tested the limits on my heart since getting birth. However, mm-hmm. from an echo perspective, everything was unchanged. So wow. I want to see how I feel from a cardiac perspective to be able to give myself the green light and saying, okay, let's try again. Mm-hmm. However, we have also had large discussions over adoption, which is something we were very much considering as well. Okay. And we are trying to figure out from a timeline perspective Mm -hmm. when that could be occurring because there's a lot of things that need to be in place through adoption, such as us not traveling (laughs) as much as we are that we can do with Lucy that through an adoption process won't be the same. There's a lot of other things that we need to be figuring out, but She will definitely be getting a sibling. I guess that is the bottom line. She will be getting a sibling in one way or another. That's amazing. I am shocked that already, and it's been less than a year, the doctors have said, sure, give you the green light as long as you plan it with us and you go through working with us like you did this first time. It's so early. It's only been a number of months. I guess I should say this from the cardiac perspective. Okay, right. The OB perspective, let's keep waiting. But from a cardiac perspective, that conversation is still on the table. Mm -hmm. That's a, okay, you did very well through this pregnancy. When and if you want to try again, we don't see an issue with it. We're just going to go through the testing that we did for the first time. Green light from that perspective, a green light from everything went well here. We don't see an issue with it again. However, we'll do some testing beforehand. It's nice to see that you had such a positive experience. You didn't go into any kind of cardiac distress. The baby didn't go into any kind of cardiac distress. So all of that's really good to know that you had, it sounds like a picture perfect pregnancy and delivery. Truthfully, yes. A hundred percent. And there's nothing I can complain about. I was preparing myself truthfully to having her need to be resuscitated potentially because I know that I had her at 36 and a half weeks and that is still carried to a safer place to where the doctors felt that everything was okay. I did get steroid shots the week before or a few days before. That mm-hmm. was totally up to my choice. That was optional. And after a discussion, we decided to go ahead with it because she herself was also small. And right. so if she was not as small as she actually was, I probably would not have done that. However, her being small, I just wanted her to get as much of a chance as possible. And so they were so amazing and put her on my chest the entire time they closed me up, which was like an hour. Oh, and oh. so she was on me. I was just anticipating her and to need to be going to the NICU. And I remember yelling out, asking if she had to go to the NICU. 
And oh. moments later, she just appeared next to me and they put her on my chest. And I just get emotional thinking about it, of course. Sure like I think do. all moms probably do. Thinking about their child's birth and it was good to go. And one thing that I think other parents might get concerned at once they initially hear it, so I wanted to mention it, is that I was separated from her for a couple of days. They put me to the cardiac ICU for precaution, not because I needed it. Mm -hmm. And they brought her to the baby nursery. We had been separated. However, in the grand scheme of things, that was the least of my concerns. I knew that she was being well taken care of and Dustin was right next to her. And sure. so it sucked. <laughs> but yeah. it was in the grand scheme of things, I knew that I was going to have her every day of my life. Yeah, you needed some time to recover so you could be the best mom you could be for her. So that totally makes sense. Exactly. Wow. Were you able to nurse her? Was that something that you wanted to consider doing? Yes, I was. And actually, so I had amazing nurses in the ICU when I was separated from her for those two days. And as I think many of your listeners and you would know, being able to leave your room in the ICU is not even really possible. <laughs> you right. have to stay in, in your room. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I couldn't see Lucy. However, I was completely fine from a cardiac standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so my nurse worked so hard to advocate to get me to go into the nursery to see Lucy. And uh -huh. they ended up being able to wheel me out. And I was able to have my own personal ICU nurse come to the baby nursery with me. So I could oh nurse Lucy. Goodness. Oh my goodness. I know that a lot of women would talk about, okay, our kid has had multiple open heart surgeries. They're working on the breast area. They're in the chest or where the breasts are. Some of my friends said when they had daughters, I wonder if my baby would be able to nurse or if something might interfere with that because they've had multiple open heart surgeries. So it's good to hear that even though you did have four open heart surgeries, that there was nothing wrong with your milk ducts that you were still able to nurse your baby as though you had never had open heart surgery. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I never thought about that until you just said that and that I could definitely see that being a concern. And one of the things, again, knowing that I was going to more than likely be separated from her for a couple of days is I tried to express colostrum before I gave birth to be able to have her have my milk when I was separated. and. I went a little overboard because that was the only thing I could control in the situation. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, control within what I could control because you cannot control your supply right. in many areas. Just want to make sure that's noted. I was able to come to the hospital with 200 milliliters of colostrum. And so she wow. was able to be completely on my milk the entire time that that's she was amazing. in the hospital separated. Wow, that's amazing. With her being born before 40 weeks. So she was born at 36 mm -hmm. and a half weeks. It would not be surprising to me if your body would not let down and let you express I that milk. What did you I do? Very, How did you do that, babe? <laughs> I talked to my OB and then learned how to self-express a little bit earlier than most people. And I started doing it at about 26 weeks. Which is still very early for yeah. it to be able to even express. Right. And I started doing it then and I was only able to do a couple of drops and then just kept being really persistent and timely on when I did it every day. And then by the end, right before I gave birth, I was able to produce about 10 milliliters. Wow. A day. I'm impressed. I was happy that there was one thing I was able to do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That shows so much dedication. Wow. That is amazing to me that you were able to do that. And what a huge success story that is. Because even women who've never had open heart surgery sometimes have difficulty with nursing their babies. So the fact that you were able to set that goal for yourself and achieve it, wow. Congratulations, Meg. That's huge. Thank you. Yes, yes. And Thank it's so you. good for your baby because she was born a few weeks early. Now, were the yep. steroid shots that you got to help her lungs to develop more fully? Is that why you got those? Yes, exactly. And yeah. again, it was because 
she was also considered very small. I wanted to make sure that she had as big of a chance as possible. Sure. And with those steroid shots, another thing with them is that they can create hypoglycemia. I think that's low blood sugar. Right. And the colostrum can help regulate blood sugar. And that's one of the big things that colostrum does. And so knowing that I was going to have the steroid shots, I knew that I wanted to try to get that colostrum so that way she could immediately have it knowing that her blood sugar wouldn't really be regulated anyway as a baby. But also on top of that, having the steroid shots, it was going to throw it a little bit wacky as well. Wow. You did a lot of research on what having a baby a few weeks early was going to entail. I think all of us going through this journey at CHD, you prioritize things when you go to the hospital or have procedures or things like that. You know what to look up and know what to want to make sure you have an understanding of. Mm -hmm. And so I completely credit my heart for so many different things that I was so well prepared for. For instance, when Dustin and I went in for my C-section, being in a hospital and understanding the different protocols and different things like that was so much easier than having that be one of the first times you would ever step foot in a hospital for yourself. Because sure. that was yep. one of the discussions we had was that mm -hmm. a lot of times going in for birth is one of the first times many mothers spend in the hospital themselves. Sure. We were well versed. We were completely comfortable and relaxed as far as being in a hospital. And I'm also incredibly grateful and contribute my heart to that. That was just another thing that instead of being a stressful, I don't know what to expect thing, being in and out of hospital my whole life, I knew exactly what to expect, <laughs> exactly what to pack. And it was wonderful. Tell me about what the most challenging part of motherhood has been so far, because it sounds to me as though just preparing for motherhood was pretty challenging for you. But now you have had little Lucy, in your life for several months outside of your body. So what's been the most challenging part since you gave birth to her? I'm kind of going off what my current challenges <laughs> are, which would be all of the extra steps you need to do anything or go anywhere mm. and cluster feeding. Those are my two things, which go hand in hand with each other because when you're trying to get things done, when they are cluster feeding, there's no way and nothing's going to happen. <laughs> That's so true. Basically, been an adjustment is that a lot of the things that I would go above and beyond to try to prepare and get things done or extra things I was working on. I think trying to figure out how to get myself into a rhythm to do as much as I can, but also give myself grace if I cannot get things done that I was hoping to get done is the most challenging thing for me right now. Yeah. And in general, so far in my four month of motherhood. <laughs> Yeah. You've always been so active. You always are doing so many different things. Are you a full-time stay-at-home mom? Currently, I am, and I am about to go back to school and then do some side stuff, some consulting here on the side. A little bit of things here, a little bit of things there. That's amazing. I'm amazed that you're even thinking about doing that with a four-month-old because, as you see, Having a baby, that's a lot of work. It's a full-time job. Uh -huh. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And I remember, truthfully, I always thought to myself, I wonder what things I'm going to think about after having a child that I thought before being like, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. Mm -hmm. And I always would think like, how do people not have time to do? Oh, people have no time to do things. I don't have any time to do anything with one child, let alone three, four. I don't know how people do it. <laughs> I really don't. I look at things now in a completely different perspective. And sure. I think I had posted this on Facebook, but during my birthday this past year, I looked at my mom and said, I actually should just be getting you a gift and you should not be getting me a gift at all. So now my birthday has a different change to me too, because yeah, thinking about, oh gosh, like when Lucy's birthday is going to happen and be like, oh, I remember your dad and I were driving to the <laughs> hospital waiting to have you <laughs> and just thinking about how you must, as a parent, think about that every birthday mm -hmm. and thinking about all of the pain afterwards. That's where the present came in for my mom that I was I know, of. right? <laughs> I did the same thing. After I had Joey, I said to my mom, oh my goodness, 
on Joey's birthday, I should get a present because I know what I was doing that day. It was the (laughs) hardest job I'd ever done. Well, I really wondered if I was going to survive it. Exactly, exactly. So I can't even imagine. <laughs> oh, but I was convinced I was going to have a C-section. I thought for sure there's no way that I'm going to be able to get this baby out. He's too big. Oh, I and... can't even imagine. Yeah, but I did. I had two <laughs> vaginal deliveries, which is pretty amazing. And I had Jaworski oh my baby, God. which is no small thing. <laughs> <laughs> but after I gave birth to Joey on my birthday, I gave my mom a gift. And the two of us, whenever we were in the same state, we would get together and go to lunch together and talk about that because you do view your mother so differently after you have a baby oh, so and differently. a mom yourself. Yeah. We only have a minute or two left and I'd love to know what advice you would have for other adults who were born with a congenital heart defect and are thinking about having a baby of their own just like you did. Get second, third, or fourth opinions if your current team isn't willing to have the conversation. Because someone will. This is a taboo. This is new. But someone is going to be willing to have that conversation with you. And if it's not your current team, another team will be willing to. Involve cardiac anesthesiology in your birth plan discussions. And don't wait until the day of. Because there were so many discussions with cardiac anesthesia Mm -hmm. that I didn't have any idea was going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And wish I had a better understanding of prior. Because their involvement in the birth is just as important as literally anyone else's yep and they are highly concerned and cautious over you as a patient Mm -hmm. and that was something that I had ran into as an issue because their cautious level was way more than cardiac cautious level and so that was oh they were the reason I stayed in the ICU extra night Mm -hmm. and even if everyone else said that they were fine with me going to a different floor, not getting that same sort of monitoring that you get in the ICU. Cardiac anesthesia, they said that they didn't want me to move. I wasn't going to move. So having them involved is incredibly important. Yeah. (laughs) Having a good backup plan if you live far from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Because I know I was incredibly fortunate because Dustin's a travel nurse. And Mm -hmm. so we were able to have him pick up a contract in the Bay Area. That area for us isn't really like an attainable place to live permanently at this point. (laughs) It's a a very, very expensive place to live. And so we wanted to have him have a travel nurse contract in that area for my second trimester on. That was something that we were able to do. However, that's not attainable for everyone to be able to be next to their hospital. Having a backup plan or a backup hospital to mm-hmm. where maybe they've even seen you or at least you could send your records over to just mm-hmm. in case. Yeah, Just having that back plan is incredibly important because you don't want to be in labor and say, oh my gosh, I have to drive six hours because that's right. not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, no, that's brilliant. Yeah, and prepare mentally beforehand because hormones are not going to help them prepare you for the mix of emotions <laughs> you're going to feel so true. the moment you see the second line. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Like, you're so right. It's hard. There's nothing to prepare you. And you say, oh my gosh, my life is about to change. And you, oh my gosh, my life is about, to... there's about five different tones. You say, oh my gosh, my life is about to change. <laughs> when you see that second line. <laughs> that is all so of the true. range of emotion. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is so true. Wow. And then last but not least, the journey is very challenging, but it's so worth it. Yeah. I love that. It is so worth it. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. My life is so full because of my children. So congratulations, Meg. And thank you for sharing your success story with us. I'm sure this is going to be an episode that other people listen to over and over again, just to make sure that did she really say that? Did she really say she was born with HLHS and she had a baby? It's a wonderful success story. I never would have even dreamed would have been possible 28 years ago. So thanks for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 
This has been so much fun. I'm going to have to have you come back later. <laughs> we have to follow Lucy. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. No, this was great. Definitely. Oh, I love it. That does conclude this week's episode. If you enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, please take a moment and leave a review on whatever platform you use to listen to our show. It always helps other people to know what it is they can expect before they actually commit to listening to an episode. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time, wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.